I'm Miles Ashley, so I run the construction at London Underground, and uh, Anthony asked me to talk, think about innovation. And uh, in order to think about innovation, I thought I'd look back and tell you a bit of a story uh, about London Underground and how innovation has played a part in the development of London Underground. Uh, now, my team have two favorite pictures. I'll show you one at the end of this presentation. Uh, but this is our favorite picture of London, and it's a, it's a picture of the most beautiful, tolerant, and productive city on, on Earth. And the numbers actually are very significant. So we transport 1.3 billion passengers a year. That's something like 4 million passengers uh, a day. Uh, and as, um, as Bill Bryson actually recently observed, at any one time there'll be 600,000 people traveling on London Underground, which makes it a more populated and far more interesting place than Oslo. And if it was just about big numbers, if it was just about big numbers, I think that would be fine. But the issue really that we face every day is growth, because um, uh, actually uh, every 35 years, if you go back to 1863, the amount of passengers that we're dealing with broadly doubles, which is very significant. You can see here uh, that in 2009, we were thinking that it might go up by about 20% in, uh, in 20 years. Uh, some five years later, we've already reached that number. So you've got this with this, this conservatism about growth always being, um, always being uh, beaten by the actual growth underlying it. And, uh, you know, we, we, we might have stations where we've got lots of people going through. So Victoria, we've got 83 million people going through that station, 10 million more than the whole of Heathrow, uh, which, of course, is... And they say they need another runway, you know, they just need to get a grip, I think. Um, and, but even at the, some of the smaller stations, like Green Park, you can have 27 million people going through uh, you know, what you might consider to be quite small stations, more than uh, you know, each one of those uh, terminal buildings at Heathrow. And of course, you know, as we grow to, 20, uh, to 10 million London's population in, in 2030, there's a sort of wider context as you see the journeys within London going from 9.5 billion uh, to 11 billion, so you know, really, really significant growth, and that that growth to 10 million people by 2030 is is the equivalent to taking Birmingham and chucking it into the middle of that picture with all of the infrastructure and services uh, that that requires, and we see it really in terms of, I suppose, tube trains. So you know, that's the equivalent of two tube trains a week. Uh, so growth is a very significant issue for us, as is reliability. And if you go back to around 2010 and 2011 as we approach the Olympics. Of course, reliability is a big topic for us. The mayor setting us this target of um, a 30% increase in reliability, which I remember thinking, well, that's impossible, isn't it? But, but actually, you know, I'm pleased to report, actually, that in the last two months, we've announced that we've increased it by 38%. So very significant growth in reliability. Um, and, and great, of course, uh, that, uh, you know, if you do cause a delay to the tube, Every night you can go to the tube station and pick up an evening standard and get a personal uh, development plan uh, for the next day, which is helpful. They are the watchdog. And, and when I wander around the office, occasionally I come across members of staff uh, with their noses buried in their keyboards, blubbing uncontrollably uh, at, the, uh, at what's happening to them. Uh, and I, I, I say that no increase in salary in the private sector uh, can replace the vocation that they are engaged with. And they look at me with, with sad but reflective eyes, which I think means they, they want to stay. They're enjoying it. Um, and we think of this perhaps as a modern malaise, this challenge, this constant challenge around capacity and reliability and keeping London moving. But actually, let me take you back to 1862. Um, and, you know, we, were, we had got part of the way with Vespadian's uh, observation that uh, if we build it, they will come. But it was still very much a two-dimensional uh, city. Uh, and actually, if you look at prints from the time, this is a scene of Ludgate Hill, um, which was madly overcrowded. And this, this process of getting people in and out of the city every day was as challenging then uh, as it is now. And you can see in the top right-hand corner an advert for the Standard newspaper uh, waiting to pounce, even though we didn't exist yet, uh, but, but readying themselves for the onslaught. Um, and several sort of mad ideas, mad ideas came out of that period as to how this, you know, this challenge of moving people in and out of the city could be solved. So this is a solution from Paxton, it's called the Grand Circle, actually anticipating the line of the circle line about 30 years later, but it could, I, I, I suggest, really upset your afternoon tea to have that thundering past your window. Uh, and this, a vacuum railway, firing you by vacuum through pipes. Um, 
no, no real news about how you were supposed to breathe, and I, I imagine it would have caused havoc with your top hat. Um, but you know, people were beginning to, to think about how this might be solved, and into this environment comes this, this, this rather amazing man, Charles Pearson. And Charles was a solicitor to the City of London. Um, he was engaged in all sorts of, um, in all sorts of um, um, uh, initiatives, uh, so slavery, freedom of votes, um, for, for women and um, you know prison conditions. So you see him getting involved in all of his all his sort of one-man pressure campaign. Uh, but he came up with this idea of the underground railway and moving people underground in tunnels via steam railway from these um, these outside stations to the centre of London. And you can imagine what that might have looked like to the average top hat wearing horse drawn hoi polloi of Oxford Street. Uh, I mean it was a mad idea and there plenty of pamphlets around at the time. Uh, you know, pointing to the lunacy uh, of this gentleman. Uh, but actually, Charles Pearson persisted. And um, he didn't actually get to see the first railway opening in 1863 because he died the year before. And typically, he had refused a payment from the railway companies for his idea. Um, but that payment was later given to his wife. And then there's Lord Ashfield. Um, uh, and Albert Stanley, as he was, uh, left school at 14. Uh, you know, ran the Detroit, started at the Detroit Tram Company. By 17, he's running the timetable. By 21, he's running the company. Um, and uh, actually, by the age of 30, having taken four years off to be in the Navy, uh, he's running the New Jersey Transport Corporation, a company of 25,000 people. But his part in this story is he comes back to London and, and almost single-handedly reshapes the way in which transport in this city works moving together these disparate and sometimes loss-making companies into the Underground Electric Railway Company. And that really is the start of London Underground and, and, and a massive contributing factor to its growth. And Frank Pick, um, again, uh, you know, drives this expansion of the railways through the 1920s and 1930s. With his architect, Charles Holden, you see him heavily influencing the way that you know London to look today. Uh, and if you go back to commentators like Charles um, Nicholas Pevsner at the time, you know, they will point to this man, you know, really driving the way in which London looks. Busy man, also reshaped all the ports in the UK uh, and the canals in the UK and, and all the evacuation plans for London during the war. So he had some sort of extracurricular activity that he managed to fit around this. And they drove this environment of change within London Underground. And, and, and that really drove the way in which the company philosophy is built. And this is Harry Beck. And Harry is famous for um, developing the London Underground map. Uh, and he was just an electrical engineer and persisted with this idea around this map. And I suppose it was the equivalent of an app, a travel app today, because it, it really helped people to understand how to use our system and change the way in which people saw interconnected travel uh, in, the, in, in, in London. And I just wanted to, I just thought I'd take, take this example to show you how brave some of this stuff was. So this is Morden in, in 1923, and here is the duck farm uh, that existed uh, on the site of Morden Station in 1823. And um, can you imagine going into uh, Osborne's office and persuading him to build a very expensive railway to a duck farm? Um, but that's exactly what these advocates did. So in 1923, that work starts in, in 1926. The station actually opens at the end of 1926. Just four years later, you see this massive expansion of housing around uh, the area. By the 1950s, you see high-rise coming in. And when, um, when I lived actually near Morden in, in, in 2000, well, if you got to here uh, in a car, you were probably within half an hour of escaping, escaping London. And this happens time and time again. Every time you make these transport investments, you get something around 50 to 100% growth in the population surrounding uh, the area of that investment. And I built you this little app to show you what these people have done in creating this environment of change. Will it work? It won't work. Hang on. So you get this very centralized population in 1863. And as the development takes place, <laughs> sorry, that app won't work. Never mind, never mind, having invested in it. But as you, you, go, you move from this very centralized population in 1863, and you see how the transport systems then enable you know, that population to spread 
over the city, um, and you know, that allows that allows the growth of London. So this is Charles Pearson's idea, you know, Albert Stanley's drive and Frank Pick's advocacy, making a fundamental difference through ideas to the City of London, the City of London that creates 26% of our GDP, uh, you know, and therefore is fundamental to the growth of our nation. And one wonders what on earth they thought in 1863 they were trying to create. Could they, could they possibly have envisaged that they would, they would create this, or, or indeed this? But there is no doubt, there is no doubt that those ideas and the the, the, the atmosphere, the, you know, the environment and philosophy of change that these people, sometimes these singular people drove, has enabled us to create the London that we know today. Um, and I think that that's rather interesting. And I think we've got to think about what we want the city of the future to look like. Will it look like this? I, th I think this is, this is out of Star Wars. I think this lacks imagination, actually. You know, a few more misshapen... Uh, high tower blocks and a funny amoeba thing sitting in the front of St Paul's. Surely, surely to God it can be better than that. You know, and maybe it will fundamentally change the way that we live and the way that we use the three-dimensional space of our city and how transport enables us to do that. Because there is no doubt that transport is the driver to enabling those future cities. And if I'd been talking to you when Morden Station had been built in 1823, I'd have been talking to you about the struggle uh, around these enormous numbers that we were having to cope with. I would be talking to you about how engineering uh, was moving to solve that, even though we've been trying to unwind this junction at Camden ever since. Uh, and I would have been talking to you um, about the, the, the pressure of overcrowding and how on earth we would be coping with it. Um, and, and, you know, throughout all of this progress of this transport system, there's always been the financial pressure here at the South Sea bubble and as we start the long depression, uh, as we start to get uh, that, those first lines underway, as throughout our major period of expansion, uh, you get the Great Depression uh, and of course nothing really changes. You know, today we're going through comprehensive spending reviews uh, and we are loyal and happy uh, in our austerity. Um, in a sense, actually, you know, when you take those numbers that I've given you and you say, well, you know, the, the, the travelling public you know, doubles every 35 years, then of course it was never possible, it was never possible to double the size of London Underground within 35 years. And therefore, you know, it has always been a, a game about innovation. It's always been about taking the existing infrastructure that we own and using it in a different way, persuading our passengers to use it in a different way, changing the relationship with those, with those passengers uh, and with the city that we serve. And so, uh, you know, we are essentially and always have been uh, a company that is driven by that innovation, that is dependent on that innovation. And indeed, London has always been dependent on that, on that innovation. So now we're talking about the digital railway, but I've just shown you actually, you know, you get the, the, the world's first automatic railway on the Victoria Line back in 67. And my hypothesis is this, really, that actually at no stage have we been inventing new technology. All of that innovation has been about taking existing technology and configuring it around our problems. And actually that most of the challenge is, is getting the cultural change around people to enable that technology to be used to serve our network. And I wanted to talk to you about you know, four of our current challenges. Things that will happen to the transport system that will, that will, you know, will start to drive a difference in Transport for London and London Underground. And the first one is how this technology is changing the relationship that we have with our customers. So many of you will be familiar with City Mapper, you know, which enables people to gain access to buses and understand that bus network in a way that they've never been able to do. do. So in a, in a kind of Harry Beck-esque way, they've suddenly been given the information to, to drive, um, you know, to drive an understanding of the bus network and how interchange works. Um, and also, I think that digital technology is changing the relationship that we have with our staff. Many of our younger staff coming in now, our apprentices, have never used email, don't use email. Imagine it, it's like taking you, bringing you into a company and inveigling you to use Morse code to communicate with your colleagues. And you know, so, so I think these things will inevitably change the relationship with our customer. I think they will inevitably change the shape of our business and they will change uh, the way in which our company fundamentally works. 
that digital technology is also changing the way in which we prosecute some of these schemes. This is Victoria, a rather unusual view from the underside, which you don't see every day. But I wonder whether actually we could have solved the technical challenges of Victoria without that digital engineering. But I think we've only just scratched the surface because like nuclear warfare, actually that digital engineering is and will fundamentally change the relationship that we have with our supply chain and how we collaborate with that supply chain and integrate that supply chain. So I think actually over the next five years, you will see this struggle play out between us having to use the digital engineering, but that conflicting with a, a corporate's view about data security and how those two things work. So how do common data environments work where you're trying to you know, fundamentally protect that data? And so you know, that, that's, a, that's a conflict. Um, and we've talked about you know, the way in which these, you know, these communication mechanisms will also uh, change the way we work. And of course, that again causes this conflict between the way that we do things today you know, and the way that our staff, and if we're going to attract the best staff, um, you know, are, are expecting to communicate and, and, our, communi uh, and our, customer, our competitors are allowing them to communicate. There's also this then this drive towards capacity and it's, it's been largely about trying to use the existing infrastructure in a different way to get more capacity. Uh, you will notice the prospectus came out earlier um, th this year which proposes that uh, we start to create an, an urban metro system uh, out of the existing uh, network rail infrastructure and we start to get 15 minute services across the whole of that infrastructure which might mean that Harry Beck's map starts to look more like this um, and we get a, a complete change uh, in the way we're looking at our estate. I think also what you'll start to see as the data using the data becomes more important is that this orthodox supply chain model, this very kind of sequential hierarchical supply chain model, uh, will start to break down or start to modify. Um, I think it's an inevitability that there will be more direct relationships driven between all owner operators and the means of production, the producers of, of, of critical assets for us. Um, I think actually you'll see us being more sophisticated in how we engage the tier one community to help us challenge the operational solutions, to integrate those resources and be driven more by outcomes than, than output. So I think that that will be um, um, an inevitable change. Ultimately, the hypothesis, therefore, is actually that when we're looking at innovation and how it changes organizations and the way we work, that fundamentally, it's not really about new technology. It's more about people uh, and how people learn to accept, encompass, and utilize that new technology to drive a different way uh, of operating. And I said that my team had these two favorite pictures, and this is the other one. And I think the meaning behind this is relatively self-evident. Uh, it, is, it is simply this, that if you're engaged in the business of, of innovation, you will always be um, uh, going up against you know, co commercial interests. You'll always be going up against um, personal interests. You'll always be going up against the, the current way of doing something. Uh, and you may also be cutting across some political interests as well. And that always, I think, entails some degree of personal risk. Everybody watching you may not always want you to succeed in that endeavor. Um, and, um, and I think the important thing to do uh, is to be cheerful in that adversity and know that uh, if you're feeling a bit like this, you're probably innovating. Thank you very much for your time. Miles, thanks very much. Um, I, I, uh, I, I do recognize the fact that you do have to keep smiling in your adversity, but no, thanks very much. It, it is very interesting to look at, I suppose, how far we have come from the old days. But it, I suppose one of the things which I, um, I do reflect on with, with London Underground, it was you know, when it all started, it was all done by private individuals who had big visions. Um, do you think that we need to go back to this whole notion of uh, private investment uh, with big ideas rather than, I suppose, the, um, uh, the publicly funded model we have at the moment. Yeah, I think ultimately, yeah, I, I think you're right. You know, one, it was American money. If you look, you know, if you look back in time, so it's the power of American money, driven by these rather singular individuals, which created this environment of change. Um, it was pioneering in that respect. But actually, it's about the way we tell the story. I think. So um, if we look back in history over, say, the Jubilee Line extension and Canary Wharf, 
then actually, you know, the business case for the Jubilee line extension at the time was 0.93. So we weren't even going to get our money back. There was no regenerative uh, element to that. But, you know, can you imagine a London without Canary Wharf? But I, I do, there are signs of hope. So when you look at the Northern Line extension, it's funded essentially through a financial mechanism that's out of future revenues. And actually, what that, that, that's a change, because that is a change that says if this infrastructure, this piece of infrastructure that we're investing in will pay back in terms of future rates growth. And I think that's a big philosophical change at the heart of how people are seeing infrastructure. Uh, going, going for a point that I asked uh, John, uh, you know, it, do you see a, a, an environment in, in, in London where apps are the future, not building new lines? Um, can we improve efficiency by changing the behaviour of people travelling around London? Or is it simply we just need more capacity? I don't, I don't think it's either or. It's, you know, at the heart of this lies value out of the infrastructure that we build and we operate. So as we start to get those apps, and there are 500 travel apps, we have 6,000 registered designers, and we put our data on free release. Now, as we start to develop that data, let's say around crowding data, people will have more choice about how, you know, the route that they take to enable them to use the infrastructure in a completely different way. And I think you see some of that emerging. So you've got these consolidation apps around bus services now emerging across the world where there aren't fixed bus routes, but the bus goes to where the demand lies. And you, you might imagine a rail uh, you know, a rail system of the future, sending that rolling stock to where the demand is greatest, rather than you know having these fixed rostered timetables. It's a scary, chaotic future. Um, we're bang out of time, but uh, is there a quick question? Anyone wants to put to Miles before he legs it off? No? Okay, Miles. Oh, there is a hand for just a moment. One moment. Thank you. Um, that, that was um, fascinating. Just, is could you tell me uh, um, to what extent? To what, what sort of what what can our regional cities learn from 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 London and, I, and are, are they beating a path to your door yeah. to say how can we move people around better yeah I mean I think uh, so there's a few things that I think devolution in those other cities will bring the, the, you know the first is that they will be more in charge of their destiny with regard to regeneration and actually what if London shows anything it shows this cause and effect between the investment in an infrastructure you know, and, and, and how that drives uh, that, re that regenerative outcome. Um, and whilst that hasn't been a feature of um, those business cases, the cases for infrastructure in the past, I think it will increasingly you know, become so in the future, because you, it's something you can't uninvent, I think. Um, and the other thing is that I think those regional centres can learn from financial models that we've employed in funding that infrastructure. So loans from, from the European Investment Bank, you know, look at the community infrastructure levy uh, legislation and also tax increment financing, which is being used on the Northern Line extension, which enables you to make these short-term investments, you know, in infrastructure, you know, and, 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 then, you know, and then pay for them out of the future revenue growth that they, they create. And I think that's the big change. That's where we can, we can really learn. And I think, lastly, I think actually those regional centres, as they grow, as they inevitably will do, can learn from us. Uh, you know, we've been through a baptism of fire in terms of our relationship with our customers and how we've modified and shaped that relationship with our customers, matured it. And I, and, and I think probably out of all of those three, that's the important one. Miles, thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. A fascinating challenge you have got. Miles Ashley from London Underground, round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.